Hey guys. Hey everybody. Matt Hill in the uh, Trace Management Podcast Studio. They're my uh, loving sponsors who give us uh, space. They're an engineering firm uh, for oil and gas. So if you need consultants or just about any kind of engineering, reach out to uh, Trace Management. And I call this the Talking Energy Show. And it's brought to you by Oilfield Tailgate because all of the people that pitch in for Oilfield Tailgate, I just want to promote them. You know, so you see all the sponsors. If you go to the page, oilfieldtailgate.com, you can go through all of them, click their links, and thank them. Or if you want, pitch in, be a sponsor yourself. It's a come, great event. Come on the show. Yeah, we have uh, 700 people approximately come through the uh, tailgate parties every home game. So there's one place to network. Boomer Sooner. Boomer Sooner. <laughs> uh, also, we accept everyone. So if you don't wear the right colors, you're welcome to still come down and We'll accept you. We'll give you free drinks and food and uh, all the fun you can possibly have at a party. But that's not really, you know, why I do it. I want the uh, I want the tailgate, you know, the whole oil field tailgate to kind of be a vehicle for talking to people and networking mm-hmm. and promoting, you know, your logo. So if you're a sponsor, you know, you can slap oil field tailgate everywhere. Yep. We know. We're in business development and marketing, mm-hmm. and uh, you've been in a long time. We find vehicles to get the word out about everything get your brand out yep introduce yourself so hey everybody my name is lisa morando i'm with laird and walking stick insurance i've known matt hill for probably about six years now and uh, i've worked in business development side by side never as a competitor thankfully uh but everybody's my competitor lisa no, i'm just sizing you up no matt's very inclusive that's part of why he does so well but uh, I started out as a MWD with Baker Hughes, and then I sold casing for Tenaris. I sold solids control, drilling fluids, managed pressure drilling, shakers, portable power, and well containment cellars for NOV. So I've gotten a good taste of uh, a lot of the ins and outs for upstream drilling here in oil and gas. And then I moved over into the commercial property and liability insurance space a little over a year ago hoping to service the oil and gas industry from a different side since I had some experience um, on what it's really like being out there. A lot of experience. I mean, really, you've done a good job. Everybody loves you. You're, <laughs> uh, you're very well known, very well loved by our industry and appreciated. And now that you're on a uh, different path, you're still part of us and vital. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. She was vital in getting me to even start doing these things. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here today unless uh, she was the very first person I ever – uh, asked to be on a podcast and pitched right in immediately and wrote the script for us. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, thank God. Somebody's actually taking this over and running with it. Well, it was both of our first podcasts. So yeah, um, I wouldn't be doing this at all. That, that lady had asked me if I wanted to be on hers and I was like, eh, I don't want to be any part of that, but I want to interview my good friends. I find interesting and especially, you know, young, um, young people in oil and gas that are, going to be our leaders someday right yeah well thank you I'm, I feel lucky to be included in that list but you know what oil and gas does for the world is very important we provide low cost energy to the entire world and you know that's something not to be taken lightly um, so I'm definitely a big proponent for our industry and everything we do for the entire world and I'm grateful to have been able to service it out on the rigs boots on the ground and then now to be servicing these companies on the insurance side to protect them so that if something were to happen, instead of going bankrupt, they've got coverage. Yeah, man. I mean, it's just, it's impossible for me to, you know, get my, uh, my head around how much energy has uh, become more and more important in the forefront of uh, everything yesterday. You know, you can't, you've come to the uh, Woolfield Christian Fellowship, you know, and, and she gets up there, you know, the director from city rescue mission here in Oklahoma city, where we, uh, host our Oilfield Christian Fellowship meetings and we give all of our resources to them uh, as we collect, uh, you know, fundraising. And I mean, I get choked up thinking about it, but just all the people uh, involved in giving to the homeless right now because energy costs may have gone up. Some family had to pick between paying their electric bill and keeping their kids warm or paying their mortgage. And all of a sudden they're, you know, they're evicted. And then we've got a facility like city rescue mission. Thank goodness you know, is, is there as a, uh, you know, a safety net, mm-hmm. but this is going around. The, this is globally happening mm-hmm. to people being starved for energy. Right. 
and affordable energy. So, you know, all hands on deck. Yep. And you have ways to insure us. That's right. So me, you know, as the vice president of Nightfire, Mm -hmm. you know, what are just some of the things, you know, as a service company and then as an operator that you think are, you know, immediate that you need to take care of that you've seen like people don't have? uh, I mean, just give it all to us. I don't I don't know enough about insurance at all. Yeah. So uh, when you're looking at a commercial insurance package, the first thing you need to do is you need to understand the the business that you're trying to insure. You need to understand what their risks are, and then they have the ability to retain some of that risk or self-insure, or they have the ability to purchase insurance to protect them if an event were to happen. So I'll start first just on if you're an operator or uh, somebody that has working interest on a well. So pretty standard, I'm sure all of you guys know about this, but you'd wanna get a control of well policy. So that will cover you if you were to have a blowout. So that would cover you know, getting crews out there like boots and coots to come suppress the fire, get the well back under control. It's gonna cover any cleanup and containment that you need to have after this uh, incident or blowout has occurred. And then it's also gonna pay for getting you back to wherever you were at in that well prior to the blowout. So if you had drilled to 10,000 feet and then after the blowout, you know, the part of the hole was lost, it would help you to um, drill back to wherever you were at prior to the incident or if you had lost the casing string or things like that, it helps to pay for those. So a good control of well policy is vital anytime you're doing a drilling project or a major recomplete. And you can also carry that policy on producing wells if you so choose to. Different operators, some of them say, hey, that's not a big risk for us on our producing wells. We don't want to carry it on those wells. Some people want it on everything. It's, you know, personal preference and we could have those discussions for each well as we we look at those risks. Um, A new product that was released within the last quarter is it's for increased cost of drilling or completion. So if you are someone with working interest, you're a working interest owner, and you've got a well coming up that you've got to set AFE for the drilling and the completions, you can purchase insurance for scheduled wells that you plan to drill or complete as long as it's a developmental well on U.S. land, so it can't be some exploratory well because we're going to be looking at offset data on other wells nearby, their AFEs, and then what they actually ended up costing. But So if you were to get this increased cost of drilling or completions, essentially if you had your AFE and then you exceeded that AFE because of a geologic anomaly such as a fault, uh, a rubble zone, an area where you're taking salt water flows, something like that that's unpredicted uh, downhole that causes you, you know, maybe you lose 10,000 barrels of oil base because you drilled into a fault that you were not expecting. This policy would pay up to $3 million per well uh, for however much you went over your AFE. So if you went over by $4 million, it's only going to pay out $3 million per well. But if you went over by $2 million, you know, you'd have a little cushion, which for some of these operators that, you know, maybe they're private equity back, maybe they're self-funded, they can't really afford to spend an extra $3 million on their That might have been their, their well. only well they ever get That's to That's right. Drill. Yeah. So this product is essential um, for people that are trying to really control their cost. And so it covers the geologic anomalies and then it also covers mechanical failure. So if you were operating your tools or equipment within their range of what their operating parameters are, um, and you had, let's say your draw works got jammed up, and then you got stuck down hole, and you've got all the non-productive time and all the guys on site, and you're, you're down for three days, and then you get stuck, and you know this product would also cover those costs. So that would be another option that could be bundled with your control of well package as an operator, or you could just do it as a bolt on. You can leave your current control of well policy in place. And again, you don't have to have it on every well. You can schedule the wells that you want to add it to. And again, we'll go through some underwriting and look at some offset wells, what their AFEs are, how much uh, they ended up costing when it was all said and done. And uh, that's a new product that you know, a lot of people aren't aware of that could really save them a lot of money. Yeah. It's a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, and that happens. How how often do you think that even happens in our industry? 
I don't know. I mean, when I was at MWD, I watched it happen all the time. Yeah. I've sold drilling fluids before. I know there's certain areas, certain areas in Oklahoma, certain areas in Wyoming, certain areas in South Texas where, you know, one out of 10 wells, you lose 10,000 barrels of oil base. And at $100 a barrel, you know, that's several million dollars that you weren't planning for. So I've seen that firsthand on the mud bills. And then I've been there, you know, I've been out there when we were drilling in Oklahoma, we were at 12,000 feet TVD. We were about 5,000 feet in the lateral. And <laughs> we kept, uh, we, we'd go to slide and then we'd back out of our drill pipe. Okay. So, of course, you trip in and trip out. And that takes, you know, a day and a half yep. each trip. So now you've been down for three days. We get back on bottom. We're trying to slide. We back out of the drill pipe again. You know, company men are trying to run us off because, like, they're just calling us back out. They're so mad at our DDs. Come to find out the ST-80 was miscalibrated by over 10,000 foot-pounds. So the reason that we were backing out of everything was we didn't properly torque up our connections. But that was a week of downtime uh, due to a mechanical failure. So those two examples I just gave you, I mean, I don't know. I think how often it happens is completely dependent on the area that you're drilling in. And I think that a lot of the... It's rough. I mean, we don't love... Uh touting our I mean we love touting our uh, wins right in our industry but right. the, the those uh failures we you yeah know, we you know never, about we you, just don't like yeah those, and you never sport. know what's going to happen down hole but I do feel that a lot of the experts in our industry and I'm going to say there's a lot of them they know which areas in their acreage position you know like I said one in five wells one in ten wells they run into some down hole geologic anomalies and or our service providers know it's like hey we're doing our qc on all of our products but sometimes there's a mistake and uh, so this just gives you a little cushion for that and you're gonna have to quote each well for that really you don't really have like a blanket price you're gonna have to look at that zone and yeah well when it comes to pricing that's a really good point that you bring up the cost for this product is a quarter of a percent of your afe cost for the well so if you had a 10 million dollar well that's a $25,000 policy. So I think a quarter of a percent of the AFE to get up to $3 million in coverage is a good that, deal. On a high risk. Yeah. yeah. And you don't have to do it for all of your wells. Once again, I think that each of our leaseholders or working interest owners, they know their acreage positions well enough to know, hey, this area could be tricky. Yep. So they can choose where they want to spend that money. Well, no, no one's going into this. I mean, that's that's the one good thing for investors in uh, insurance for oil and gas is mm -hmm. we're all very uh, protective of those wells. Right. We we don't want to see them fail. No. So, you know, we're doing everything possible to make sure that that insurance is there but never utilized. Right. Well, and then I guess if we're talking about operators, another policy that we write for operators is downhole tool insurance or lost in hole. So it's for your MWD tools and or wireline tools. You guys all know how expensive those are if they're lost down hole. So essentially we would insure the tool so that if it got stuck or lost down hole, the policy would pay out instead of having the operator have to pay that, you know, 300000 or $500,000 for or that. Or a million dollars for, for, for some of the tools. And yeah. uh, the main area that we've found a lot of uh, traction for people looking for those policies, and, you know, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus here, but... Um, you can just say operator, it's fine. Well, with different service providers, I'll just leave it vague. Yeah. There's different service providers, any service provider that you're using for your wireline or MWD tool, uh, they have language in their downhole tool insurance. And some of the big boys in their language for their downhole tool insurance, there's things such as you need to attempt to fish for the tool and prove that you latched on to the tool at least three times to get the policy to pay. So... Nobody should be paying for that insurance policy because the odds of you being able to prove you latched onto the tool are about zero. Hmm. And if you did latch onto the tool, you probably pulled that sucker out. So you don't need the policy. So I've had several sales reps for these different service providers tell me point blank, we tell our customers not to buy our insurance policy because it'll never pay out and it's going to piss them off. So then they send them my way. And then additionally, another one, you know, it's got language you have to latch onto the tool two times and those are two of our largest service providers in the world hey that's so, a that's a rough spot to be in you've got you know your own equipment down hole that right. you don't want to lose right. it is really i mean so, so say one of my jars right mm -hmm. i mean 
if you lose one of my jars down hole, it's about a hundred and fifty thousand dollar tool, right? Yeah. I mean, if as you build it, but yeah. I mean, some people are are like, oh, it's only one hundred fifty thousand dollars, but we do not want to lose a tool. No. And now I'm relying on a a third party to go and fish it out. Right. I mean, it's like, oh man, we can't we can't afford to lose tools anymore. It's too hard to get replaced. We may never get that tool back once we get the even if we get the money. Yeah. You know. Well, are you guys um, asking the people who are running your tools to purchase insurance on them, or do you have it in your contract that if they lose it, they pay for it? A little bit of both. I mean, yeah, and, and they have their own insurance. You know, it goes yeah. it goes both ways. All vendors, you know, have their own ways you can insure. You know right. that stuff. Yeah. But like you said, you know, we're once something's downhole and uh, you can't grab it, you're hoping that another party yeah. can do it. Or some of these uh, MWD wireline carriers, their policies will say it'll pay out up to 50% of the value of the tool. Wow. Well, maybe you don't want to have to eat that other 250,000 or 500,000. That's where you'd come to me to get, you know, 100% of the tool value covered. So things like that for operators are some ways that we can come in and help. Um, you know, when it comes to service companies, the term service company is so broad yep. because as I said, or just right on the front of this is the type of insurance you need is completely dependent on what your business is and what the risk is in that business. So if you're a service provider that goes out on site, you are boots on the ground when someone's drilling a well or completing a well, you're going to need more insurance or a more expensive insurance policy than somebody that's just dropping off tools on site, you yeah, know, maybe. never really setting foot on site and leaving. Um, so if you were a service provider that was uh, – boots on the ground, you know, there's some endorsements that you're going to want on your policy to ensure that if something happened, you would have coverage. So, you know, like some of those endorsements would include, there's something called a underground resources endorsement. So that would be on your general liability policy. So that just means that if something happened on site due to your guys's work or your equipment and you cause some kind of damage down hole you know, to the reservoir, maybe you polluted the water table, who knows what happened underground that you caused that issue, this policy would pick up and pay for those third party damages, maybe you fracked into somebody else's well, and they're saying you ruined our well, and we're going to sue you for the dollar value of the well, right? So that underground resources endorsement is crucial to your business. Um, another one would be blowout and cratering insurance. So again, you're the service provider, you're out there drilling the well, completing the well, well, your operators have a, a control a well policy for a blowout, which uh, protects third, or it protects the protects first, them first party, it protects well, yeah. them, versus this blowout and cratering endorsement for the service companies, it protects third party. So um, if you're paying for bodily injury or property damage to others. So if somebody else was hurt out there and it's deemed your fault, your policy is going to pick that up. But if you don't have that blowout and cratering endorsement, you have no coverage. And that could be the difference between going bankrupt after a loss or, you know, as sad as it is that people are injured or property is damaged, you just move on down the road and your mm -hmm. policy pays for that. That's what you pay for insurance on. Well, for now, because there's definitely uh, winds of change blowing. There's, uh, there's insurance companies out there that don't really even want to be involved in oil and gas anymore. Oh, they yeah. We, we see that a lot. Um, it's. I mean, what you're doing now is, like, essential to oil and gas, and we're, like, thankful that the people that are involved with you want to be involved. Well, thank you. Yeah, the, the whole reason I even got into insurance, um, you know, my fiancé has a health insurance brokerage, so he does employee benefits, meaning health insurance, 401K, all of that. So I'd been going around to some of my oil and gas contacts, trying to get him in the door, just saying, hey, can you have Ryan come sit down and talk to you about your health benefits? And a number of people said to me, Lisa, you know, what we really need help with is our commercial property yep. and casualty insurance. We're underinsured. Yeah, they said, well, they said, no one will you know, us. no, no, no. They said, my agent doesn't understand what we do. Yeah. You know, if I want to get downhole tool coverage, I called him 20 times. I tried to explain we are in cased hole, not open hole. This is going to be a quick wireline run. We're going to be downhole a matter of hours, not days. You know, their agent just wasn't familiar enough with the industry to understand the terminology that was being used to then be able to even communicate the risk to the carrier. So 
it really was something where I realized there was a gap where it was an underserved market because oil and gas is its own animal. We have our own language. We do things differently than a lot of other industries. And if your agent doesn't understand your business, they might not write your policy correctly. And there's a number of agents out there that are competent to write oil and gas, but not very many. So that was where I thought, you you're know. the only one. If you're in oil and gas and using anybody else, there's no point. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say all of that, but I do feel that. Uh, going to be ringing off. I, I said, my <laughs> But get more phones. I do feel like, you know, having a firsthand experience of being in the business on multiple different sides, being in operations, you know, it helps me to understand how people run their businesses and to better help cover their risks. Um, so that's been, it's been really cool, actually, to get to sit here and really sit down with the different company owners and understand, okay, what is it exactly that you guys do? And then also, you know, what are your safety programs? What are your safety training? Like, what are your onboarding processes? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it that you have in place already that you're doing better than other people that I can highlight to the insurance carriers to try to get you a better deal? Because insurance is expensive. It's expensive. So it's my job to tell the story and paint the picture of what we're doing to help prevent those risks so that I can get you a lower price. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to need that because we're we need bringing that. on more people. Yeah. <laughs> Our whole industry is begging for hands. Right. Yeah. It's. I mean, that's a whole nother animal that I don't have a solution for. We are definitely shorthanded. You know, it's hard to find people that want to work. You know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people, you know, some of my friends work at HMP, Baker, Halliburton, you know, anybody where Anyone you're trying to hire them. Looking and for more people to bring on. Yeah, they don't even, there's not very many people there that really want to work. Maybe they're just showing up to the job fair to just prove that they attempted to interview somewhere, have you sign their sheet of paper and they leave. Or, you know, you tell them you got to take a drug test. Again, they just leave. And then the ones that actually allegedly wanted to work okay they pass their drug test they show up they get out on site you know some of them don't even last a day out there because it's hard work i mean i you know lived on rigs for about a year and a half i put in those 12 hour days which sometimes were 36 hour days depending on oh, we've, yeah. if we're rigging up rigging down <laughs> stuck who knows all hands on deck so also drive out here and drive back yeah. and like your windows breathing at you <laughs> and there's all of there's you know snow you know coming at your windshield yeah. and you're like Oh my gosh, I'm right. so dangerous. Right well, now. and I know this is a, uh, you know, this podcast is tailored to oil and gas professionals, but in case there's anybody else on here that is listening that's not in oil and gas, I mean, what this community, this industry does for the world is huge. I mean, these guys are out there, guys and ladies are out there working 12 hour days, like Matt said, in the 100 degree weather, in the snow grinding so that you can have your fireplace turn on you can heat your home you can drive your heroes. car like it's a big deal and uh, i appreciate everybody who is out there on holidays you know because they're you these rigs run 24 7 they don't lay down because it's christmas they don't care that it's new year's i've been out there myself on thanksgiving and that becomes your family is the people out on the rig with you and i've missed it's a big deal everyone's birthday before i've missed every holiday yeah. before just because and I, I agree they're heroes and man the uh political climate around the globe is uh a little bit scary for a lot of people and you know we as Americans and offer a way, I mean, we can do it. We can provide the entire planet, mm -hmm. you know, affordable and abundant energy, right. low cost, you know, and with, uh, I mean, the chance to be free in your own country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Energy independent. Yeah. We, we don't want, you know, we're, we're not going around the globe and, and uh, wanting to wage war. We're no. trying to give everybody the same opportunities we have. Right. And when it comes to, you know, wind, solar, other energy, um, we need them all. renewable energies, that's right. They are a part of the energy equation. One of the beautiful things about oil and gas is um, you, you, oil and gas, it stores the energy for you. You can transport it to different places. That's why it's a reliable, low cost energy that, you know, you could make the argument that there's cleaner options out there, but in our current with current technological advancements and current infrastructure right now, it really is the only reliable energy resource that we have. And, you know, solar, wind, all these renewables, again, they're part of the equation. All made and, by oil and gas. Well, <laughs> and, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, that's not even to talk about the oil and gas byproducts that we use. You know, of oh, course, we uh, run our vehicles, amazing, yeah. but, you know, 99% of the components in your iPhone are made from oil and gas byproducts. So if you want to say you're anti-oil and gas, try throwing away your phone and see how you feel about it then. If you're anti-oil and gas, <laughs> and I always tell people this because I can't wrap my head around not having oil and gas other than you take off all your clothes. That's right. And you walk into the woods and you survive because that's it. <laughs> Good luck surviving. <laughs> I mean, I I'd might. have trouble. <laughs> I, I'd be okay. <laughs> You'd probably be okay. I would I'd not. probably low-key enjoy it. Like, I'm rubbing sticks together. I made fire. I built a hut. I have a loincloth now from yeah. an animal. I don't know what kind of animal yeah, it was. Yeah, he wove some leaves together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw something stirring in the woods and I stabbed it with my pointy stick. I'd be all right. Yeah. Well. But, you know, you, you touch on technology and that's, you know, something that uh, I just find fascinating that our industry has gone so quick to automation and data mm -hmm. but as we automate you know so we may not be swinging as many sledgehammers anymore right. and using you know muscle but that means that there's some new gadget or some new you know whatever it might be that means that we need even more people because that mm -hmm. gadget now requires like the inventor and the right. tech to fix it and run it so Every person we get rid of that might be, you know, using their muscle, we probably need five people in our industry doing the new job yeah. created by the new technology. Right. Well, and I think that's another good point that you bring up um, to anybody out there listening that maybe they're not in oil and gas. Maybe they're at a point where they're in their career where they're trying to decide what their next move is. I think a lot of people get this idea in their head that oil and gas is for, you know, Rough old types. men or people that, you know, just want to go out and do serious manual labor. And I'd like to, you know, combat that thought process and say, no, oil and gas is high tech. It's sexy. NASA borrows a lot of its technology Military from borrows, the oil and gas industry because we are leaders in, you know, we're drilling 15,000 feet deep and then we're doing three mile laterals. And, and I'm talking sure, to that equipment. Exactly. Down underneath hole, the ground. mud pulse telemetry. Yeah. Like that was the thing, you know, I, I studied chemical engineering. I had the opportunity to go into a lot of different industries and I chose the oil and gas industry because I'm so passionate about the fact that we're powering the world and it's not some ancient technology. No, we are on the cutting edge of technology. And if you want to do something cool and exciting and use the most high tech components that there are, this is the place to be. So I also want to put that out there to anybody that's trying to decide, you know, what do I want for my future? Oil and gas is a, it's a great place to be. It's never going away. I would say at, at least a hundred years, it'll be at least a hundred years before it backs off because I'll our energy that, demand probably. is increasing every year. So, I mean, again, even with, as the renewables come on and are able to provide more energy, which is great, we're going to need it. Um, our demand is growing so quickly that the oil and gas demand is also increasing. The only other molecule of energy we could use would be, you know, nuclear. I think that nuclear is going to make a big comeback, yeah. but, uh, we have to go and explore how to use it. Well, we've, we've developed uh, oil and gas for so long. We're yeah. really good at it. Yeah. And we're only getting 10% out of the ground. Right. Of what we really, you know, could other than natural gas, which is even better yeah. than oil. So nuclear is going to take, it's going to take a while for those efficiencies to, you know, make themselves known because of research and yeah. development. Well, and I think there's a lot of efficiencies to be had with nuclear. I think that's going to be an energy resource that we're going to be looking at in greater detail. Um, from seeing back to the future car where he just dumps some stuff into the top of his car out of the trash can yeah. and it melts it down into, you know, the atoms and then right. shoot, he's flying off in the car. Right. Where's my flying car? Well, yeah, I mean, the reactors that they use for either nuclear fusion or nuclear fission, um, there's you know, those reactions are chain reactions and they can generate energy. We've seen firsthand from some of the different nuclear facilities that were in Russia that were not designed properly, that took out the whole city and still are uninhabitable. Um, you know, that was, I think that as we get more of a standardization in the plant design for these uh, nuclear fission, nuclear fusion facilities where there's supposed to be barricades. It's supposed to be an isolated chamber to where if there was something that were to go wrong, there are barriers in place to prevent, you know, some of these tragedies that have happened at some of these uh, less, you know, pl plants that were designed poorly. So uh, I'm hopeful that 
you know, that will be another part of the energy equation. Although I am looking forward to Godzilla finally coming about from <laughs> Japan. That's super cool. Oh, well, I hope I'm not around for that <laughs> the one. The whole nuclear facility slides into the ocean. And now Godzilla, <laughs> any day now, is coming out. I'll finally get my real-life movie. <laughs> yeah, any day now. But, yeah, the nuclear facility should not be on the coastline. But we digress. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's whatever. I guess they were using the ocean water to keep it cool, something oh, like yeah. that. And then, you know, you get enough... Uh, enough of that in the ocean i'm sure it probably it probably won't be as cool as godzilla It'll probably have like fish well i think so. part of the reason you don't want to put them by the coast is because if you were to have a explosion you can induce um hurricanes and tsunamis and uh have some that's happened in the past in it's japan impressive. i was just having a conversation with my grandfather about nuclear energy this last week um he of course you were yeah <laughs> he, he's a phd electrical yeah. engineer and uh he's convinced that well, Rolls-Royce right now is in Did he come to the tailgate party with you that time, too, or just your dad? Just, just my dad. Yeah, yeah. he's cool. I like him. Thank it. you. Great but, uh, yeah, Rolls-Royce, like the car, is uh, investing in nuclear power plants. Um, so it's my stock pick this year. Watch nice. out. Nice. Yeah. Got any others? Just that one for See, now. See, I like ETFs because... Oh, I've got a lot of ETFs. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, and by all means, I'm... I'm uh, I, throw a lot of risk at oil and gas yeah. <laughs> i get involved i'm like well, you understand the market it makes it easier. even if i don't i'm just I, i'm so passionate about it right. i maybe over believe and it's like you know what it's okay i'm gonna put all of my money in oil and gas yeah <laughs> i like to diversify a little bit <laughs> yeah i should probably let somebody else handle my money sometimes because i'm like it's gonna be fine yeah i've hired help for sure <laughs> So I want to get back to insurance because I, I can't get enough of uh, what you're doing these days. And uh, so, so me as a service company, mm -hmm. you know, what should I be looking at as my budget? You know, like what, what, what sh should my budget, how much of my budget should co have uh, insurance on it? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, again, depending on your line of business, depending on your risk, you're going to see differences in your premium for your insurance. Um, the premiums are pretty much always rated on either your company's payroll, your company's revenue, or if you're talking about a control of well, it could be like footage or number of wells and, and information about the wells. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, I don't, that doesn't make any sense. Why does it matter how much money I make to insure me? But essentially, you know, the more people you're paying, the more revenue you're generating, the more business you are conducting, the more likely you are to have a risk. So as your revenue goes up, as your payroll goes up, your insurance costs are going to go up. In addition to that, your loss history. So how many claims you've had, how many things have gone wrong. You know, if you can help keep those claims down, if you can come in with some really good safety practices, some good uh, quality control on your equipment, um, you know, reducing labor from people and moving to machinery to help, you know, those lifting, twisting, trip, slips, falls, you know, good hygiene practices in your safety protocol is going to save you a lot when it comes to how much it's going to cost. Um, you know, some some companies that have higher risk, people that are out in the field, you know, their insurance costs more than all their payroll. It's a huge line item. And so getting making sure, one, you're getting the right coverage for your business, but you're getting it at the lowest cost. And, you know, another thing that – another type of insurance that we provide that's a little bit different that not a lot of agents talk about that's available is something called a captive, right? So you could be in a group captive where instead of having the market determine your insurance costs where, you know, you've got someone like a Chubb or a Travelers or a Lloyd's that are, um, they've got so many losses. Chubb's part of API, right? Are they? I'm not certain about yeah. That I know Chubb is a big writer for oil and gas, Zurich, um, Lloyd's of London, you know. Yeah, Travelers, Zurich, Lloyd's of London, Chubb, that's about it. Lot I mean, there's mid-continent. Here in Oklahoma, there's National American Insurance Company. We love working with them because. They're Oklahoma and they yeah, know our Oklahoma business. Yeah, they're Oklahoma-based company. They write a lot of oil and gas. They pay their claims. And then there is a claim. They send out one of their employees on site or employees, you know, from Oklahoma to go out to the site wherever the incident happened versus, um, you know, if you work with a bigger insurance company that have to hire consultants or contractors to go out and look at that risk, it's just uh, it's a lot faster and cleaner when you handle it in-house. So National American Insurance Company does a really great job here in Oklahoma. But if you're placing your insurance with a carrier like that, your premiums are going to be dependent on your losses, you know, your risk, 
but then also off of all of the losses that other companies that are being insured by that market have had in the last year. So, you know, maybe you didn't have any losses, but maybe five rigs blew up in Oklahoma. You know, I shouldn't, I don't even want to talk like that, but maybe they did. And so that insurance carrier is going to have to increase everybody's premiums to help offset those losses. So something you can do is you can get into a group captive where instead of rating your insurance costs based off of the losses that the market has had, your premiums are only dictated by your losses. So if you can get your losses down, you have a lower premium. And in addition, Um, they set it up so that if you are not having losses, you have the opportunity to get 60% of your premium dollars back. So you paid for your insurance, you paid a million dollars, and then you didn't have any losses that year. That means you get $600,000 back. That's a big deal. So if you are a larger company that has more than $250,000 in premium for your workers' comp, your auto, and your general liability combined, we can look at putting you into something called a group captive, where, like I said, you have the opportunity to get 60% of your premium dollars back if you don't have losses. That's several hundred thousand dollars a year. And for these good, safe companies, why would you put your insurance in the market where you're paying for everyone else's losses? Let's base your premiums off of your losses and keep that money in-house. Nice. So um, those are some things that we do differently, that we, uh, we work with captives. We've got multiple um, insureds or different companies in those. That's something that we look at. And, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Maybe that doesn't make sense for, for your company due to one reason or another. And, you know, then we can look at playing with your deductible, right? Like if you're trying to cut your insurance costs because everyone wants to cut their insurance costs, you're not having a lot of losses – well, let's look at where your deductible is. We can increase your deductible, and then your premium is going to go down. It feels like all of our insurance goes up and up and up and up. But, I mean, like you just said, if if we uh, look at it in that way, like, hey, by the way, we have ways to you know, yeah. lower those costs. Yeah. And also, if we don't have the right coverage, you know, I might be paying – you know, I, oh, I want my coverage. I, I don't. I don't want that much coverage. Right. Well, then, you know, next time that incident happens, you're in trouble. Yeah, I've seen. Oh man, some of the things that I've seen just are insane. Where, you know, people have their excess or umbrella policies. The point of that is to go over top of your yeah, I want to go way comp, over the top. Your GL and your auto. You've got those underlying policies that maybe have a million dollars in coverage. Then you want to go get your umbrella policy to go over top of those to extend them. So instead of having a million dollars in coverage, you have ten million, or however much your uh, contract or MSA says you need to carry. Right? You know that's uh, that's something you brought. You know I hate going off in the weeds, but I I always do. So the the MSAs today are you know mm-hmm. they're they're pretty uh, they're intense. Robust, yeah. <laughs> you know the uh, if if I have a portal it out at a location. I still have to carry the same amount of insurance as the guy with the you know, trailer house over there. It depends on the MSA, right? Yeah. So at our agency, uh, at Laird & Walking Stick, we review MSAs for our customers free of charge. And we're not legal counsel. The part no, we're yeah. reviewing is the insuring agreement and the indemnity. But different... MSAs I've reviewed, some of them have different classifications broken out for service providers to say, are you a tier one, a tier two, or a tier three in your risk for what you're providing for our for the operator? And if you're in tier one, you only have to carry a million dollars in insurance. If you're tier two, it's five. If you're in tier three, it's 10. But and you I, also can go in and look and say, you know what, I'm willing to provide you that million dollar insurance because you are such a low risk out there. You know, you, you show up once at um, a month when they move the rig off location. Right. And, so know, what, what I actually do is, let's say you're dealing with a, an operator that does not have those different tiers broken out, and mm-hmm. they're asking you to carry $10 million of insurance. And all you do is drop off a, you know, some frack plugs yeah. on site. You're not, even, you're not even on site, technically. You just drop it off. Bomb you well, over. Exactly. So then what we would do is we would just say, um, we're going to ask for a variance. So we draft up a letter for our insured that says we do not feel we need to carry $10 million because we're not actually going out on site. Our liability really would not likely ever exceed a million dollars, and we want you to grant us a variance to reduce that um, coverage to a million instead of $10 million. So those are some of the things we do t- to help our customers reduce that insurance burden. Well done. And they still get to be on, you know, a vendor's list. That's right. That they yeah. wouldn't have got to That's otherwise. Right. Or we can add a policy. We can always like increase the coverage, 
you know, another thing that we do that not a lot of people know about is uh, it's called contract specific coverage. Yeah. So let's say you have an operator that says you need to carry $10 million in your excess policy. Well, everyone else you work for only requires you to carry $5 million or $1 million. What we can do is we can go get a contract specific umbrella or excess policy where instead of it being based on the revenue for all of the companies that you work for for the whole year, we're only going to pay base that policy on the revenue from that project or that yeah. contract, contract specific. So you don't have to carry that 10 million for everybody that you do business for just for that one account. And if that is something you need to do, you should go ahead and pass that cost on to the operator. Say, okay, you're, yeah. I mean, it's the cost of doing business and a lot of people may hem and haw and say, oh, Lisa, like this insurance is so expensive. Pass I can't afford it. it. Right pass that you. on. That is a cost of doing business. You need to get your coverage right so that you're in compliance with all of their MSAs. And so you're protected if something were to happen. Yeah. If something happens out there, everybody on location they get called named. into the suit everybody. even if they weren't even out there yep. but they were just uh or you have a logo out there it's yep. you're part of it yep i've seen it yep. yeah rough well this is what we do everybody we have amazing conversations <laughs> about oil and gas and time flies really quickly but i'm gonna let her get out of here so how do uh, how do people get a hold of you and uh start working on this because everybody if you're in oil and gas or not in oil and gas, you need to be calling and texting and emailing and going on their website and getting Lisa to come to your office and uh, start reviewing uh, how you're insured. Well, thank you. Yeah, Matt and I, I mean, we've really just scratched the surface on insurance. I'd love to oh, we could do this all get time. in the weeds with each and every one of you to see, you know, maybe you've already got the right coverage at the lowest cost, and I'll just tell you that flat out. Or maybe there's something we could do to, to get the package um, tailored a little better to you. So if you have any questions, you can email me at Lisa, that's L-I-S-A, M as in Morondo, my last name, at L-W-I-N-S.com. So that's Lisa M at L-W-I-N-S.com. Or you can always call me or text me. And my cell phone is 405-641-4601. So thank you for having me I on here, Matt. I edit that out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I'm going to keep it in there. Um, I know. I'm going to get all these like prank calls. I'm like, do I give them my Just from me and my friends, and yeah. Like, why not? Why not? <laughs> Shardy does sometimes. You know, you just got to get a hold of her and say, where's your boyfriend? Why isn't he here yet? Beyonce. <laughs> Beyonce. I know. He he did the right thing. Lock it down. You locked him down probably. That's what I think. I don't think so. I would do it. I, I'm kind of team Ryan, just saying. Yeah, right. he's pretty great. Yeah, pretty great. Thank you for what you do. Yeah, God bless you. you. Make Making me do all of this. You know, every time I'm messing with a gadget and it doesn't work. I'm like, Lisa, <laughs> <laughs> you should be up here doing this. You're my co-host from now on. Take care, everybody. Thank God bless. Guys. We'll Have see you next holidays. time. Happy holidays. Bye.